Welcome to Connecting Communities. I'm your host, Nancy Bocci. With me today is Lieutenant Jim Keenan, a 32-year veteran of the Somerville Fire Department. Thank you for coming on, Jim. My pleasure as always, Nancy. Good morning. Thank you. Every year we have uh, representation from the fire department and you've been generous enough of your time with the support of Chief Sullivan to come on and really share very important information for our community. Fire prevention is a topic that needs as much conversation, I think, as people are willing to have and willing to hear on this topic. Uh, public safety is hugely important and when we think of fire safety, it's a topic that people often shy away from because it's a scary thing to talk about. So I think any way that we're able to share information is a benefit to our community. This year, in recognition of Fire Prevention Week, the theme is Every Second Counts Plan Two Ways Out, which emphasizes the importance of escape routes from your home. Again, something that maybe people don't think of on a daily basis, but is definitely something that's worth considering and doing some planning for. Yes, yeah, so like you said, um, prevention, it's a lot easier to prevent fires than to put them out after yes. they start. Uh, and people have that mindset, oh, it'll never happen to me. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't really, it's not in the forefront. And that's why we try to get out in the community, in the schools, and, and get people to think about it. You know, not to scare you, just to prepare you. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, if you do have an incident at home, you know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you practice it, you know what you're going to do. It, you know, like just those few extra seconds may make mm -hmm. a big difference. Well, when you think of that too, like when we think of our own homes, you know, it's where you're the most comfortable, where you're the most familiar. But if, you know, God forbid there was a fire, your entire setting is now very different. There's a panic that sets in, that sense of urgency of needing to get out. And what you live with every day all of a sudden becomes unfamiliar terrain, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. And especially if uh, the fire does get going and you, you know, get smoke in the house and, mm -hmm. you know, you're disoriented. So that's why we, you know, we tell the kids in schools and it works for all of us. Um, we call it Edith Escape Drills in the Home, mm -hmm. and that's like the, this theme this year. You can get this grid and... We're going to actually see that in a moment. Excellent. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't have to be an engineering drawing. You know, mm -hmm. you can do it with crayons, little kids, you know, middle-aged kids, what teenagers, mm -hmm. you, me. Um, so a representative scale, mm -hmm. you know, the rooms, bedrooms, kitchen, living room. Right. And, of course, the exits. Which are clearly the most important part is we're going to just take a look at a moment when we think of the two ways in and out, I mean, is indicated it would automatically default to like your front door and your back door. And we can talk a little bit if that's not necessarily true in your home, um, other ways to consider that. But why don't we take a second and look at the grid and we'll be able to see, as you emphasize, the importance of conducting this, whether you're an adult or a child, to be able to really map it out when you consider everything that's in your home. I know you and I have touched on this in the past. It's like, oh, there's a throw rug. That looks lovely. And then you realize that becomes a bit of a hazard. So why don't we take a second and we'll look at the grid. So you see um, it's a piece of graph paper. And again, it doesn't have to be exactly to scale. You mm -hmm. can just, but, you know, just draw every room in your house. And, you know, you label it bedroom, living room, kitchen, you know, your bedroom, your kid's bedroom. And then you will... Um, you can take a pencil or crayon and draw mm -hmm. from the bedroom to the front door or from the mm -hmm. bedroom to the back door. And it's just, it's it's just um, re-emphasizing. You know, mm -hmm. the more you practice it, the more you do it. And then you actually want to do it. We've talked about that in the yes. past. You actually want to practice it. Uh, you know, we can do it during the day and do it at night. And it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be 2 in the morning. You know, it gets right. stuck at 7 o'clock now. Um, <laughs> yeah, sadly, as we know, with the season changing. Yeah. <laughs> but it does emphasize that, the importance of conducting them at least twice a year. Mm -hmm. I think it makes sense if you're doing it around the time that you're checking your uh, smoke detector, all of that. So you just kind of become, you can have almost like a safety-focused activity with your family or whatever. So you're understanding and emphasizing to them the importance of knowing your escape routes, the importance of keeping your equipment well maintained. I mean, doing it in the day and at night offers such different options because, as I said, we're familiar with what we have, but things look very different. Yeah. I mean, think of it, you get up in the middle of the night to get a drink of water, and all of a sudden it's like, where did that table come right. from? <laughs> it wasn't there <laughs> exactly. earlier, but things just look very different. And, and, you know, it's Fire Prevention Week. That's why we're talking about it. But we want it to people, like I said, if you practice it a couple of times a year, it's not just going to be... A, the, the first or second week of October. You're mm -hmm. going to remember it. Right. Because and, and it, it could happen anytime. Mm -hmm. Another thing to consider as well is we think of children and as ages vary, the amount and capacity a person has to escape on their own. 
So when we think of that with young children, the automatic instinct as a parent is to help them, but mm -hmm. as they age, and kind of giving them more responsibility. So when you're doing the classes in the school, obviously your, your conversation is different based on age. Do you see as the kids get older, them wanting to kind of assume more of the responsibility for it, to kind of take a more active role in the planning? Yeah, uh, it's funny, even the really young kids, they, they really want to be involved. They always have a lot of questions or, or a lot of stories like, you know, because um, surprisingly, small incidents have happened to a lot of these kids. Mm -hmm. You know, they've always got uh, stuff to tell us about. Um, and they do, they really have invested in it. And that's why we go in the schools and that's why we do these things mm -hmm. like we're doing today to get people invested in it. You do have, it's your house, not mm -hmm. mine. Right. <laughs> you know? You, know, you don't want to see me there. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, it's a very different vibe, though. So as we get to young adults and we start thinking of like our high school age students and the responsibilities they have in other areas, I think it really makes sense for them to view themselves as partners in this sort of planning. Because as we know, it's one thing to talk to people and have information absorbed. It's very different if people feel a level of investment and accountability for it. So I think it's also important to emphasize that you are responsible for your own safety as well. Yeah, and you know, when you get kids that age, teenagers, adolescents, mm -hmm. you know, they think they know everything anyways, right. and they're also, they feel like they're invincible. Yes. And it's not to scare anybody, it's just to make them aware, like I said, give them an investment in their safety and yours. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you used a good phrase earlier, it's not to scare, it's to prepare. Exactly. And I, really, I think that's important though, because, you know, it, it's a cliche, but knowledge is power, right? So if you feel do you have the tools within yourself if something were to happen that you're in charge of your own escape, right? So, I mean, it's different. The more education you get, the level of comfort, I think, grows. Not that anyone is ever at ease with the idea of there being a fire, but it feels very different if something were to happen and you know you've practiced a drill and you've practiced your meeting spot, which is something I'd like you to talk about a little bit, too. Yeah, and that's, again, one of the reasons we do the SAFE programs, um, Student Awareness of Fire Education. Uh, when these kids are young, we don't want them to be afraid of us. I mean, it could be scary if we walk into your house all, you know, mm -hmm. uh, fitted out with our equipment. And Darth that's Vader. why we go in there. <laughs> it is. The <laughs> voice is very much like Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I always joke with the kids like that. You know, because that gets in their head, too. They, you know, they remember that. So, yeah, we want them. That's part of, you know, you said knowledge, education, being used to it. And, and it grabs them, I think, a little bit. They, you know, kids are sponges. They really want to do it. And, again, as they get older... It, maybe makes it a little more difficult for them mm -hmm. to listen to us. Right. But again, you want to be ready in case something happens. You want it to be second nature, not like, mm -hmm. what do I do now? You right. know, where I, do I go? You know, maybe you're in the bathroom when the smoke detector goes mm -hmm. off. You know, you left the pot on the stove. Now right. you come out in the hallway, what do I do? You know, mm -hmm. now you know what to do. And of course, we always say, if you can get out the door walking briskly, that's fine. Mm -hmm. If the smoke is banking down, you want to get on your hands and knees. If it's really low, get on your belly. I always say, tell the kids, like a soldier in you mm -hmm. know, boot camp, <laughs> right on your belly and just get out. And the meeting places you brought up, that's really important so that we know everybody's out, everybody goes to the same place. I, I tell kids, maybe have a tree in front of your house, mailbox, telephone pole. It could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, generally we'll say, go to your neighbor's front stairs. Mm -hmm. You know, we just want to know that everybody's out. Well, I think the importance of that, too, when you think of safety, so that's for the members of the household safety, but also for the safety of the first responders coming on scene. If, you're, if people are scattered around and you're hearing someone say, I think someone's still in my home, mm -hmm. that, that's very different than being able to count heads and say five of us are here, everybody's all set. And I think, too, the importance of pets now. People do feel pets are part of their families. I mean, oh, I, I love my course. cat very much. But that sense, particularly, I assume, when you talk with young children as well, the importance of not going back into your home for anything. Right. That's actually part of Edith. Um, mm -hmm. Don't go back in until an adult or a firefighter especially tells you it's safe to go in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we get there, we're going to make a primary search anyways. Yep. But like you just said, if you tell us that everybody's out, because you know, Right. You know, we always joke, there's always a baby and a 90-year-old lady right. up on the third floor, right. you yep. know. That's but it. Uh, it makes it, you know, we'll still do our search, mm -hmm. um, but it's really good to know that everybody's out safely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's very different when you think of, you know, kind of the chaos of the moment of that. You know, you have lights and sirens and a lot of people on scene, and it seems that it would be very easy without a designated meeting space for people to just kind of go a bunch of different ways. So if your friend lives across the street, maybe you go there and then mm -hmm. you're checking something on your phone to see if you can get a hold of someone. And without that identified spot, 
there's valuable time that's really being wasted looking to make certain that everyone is where they're supposed to be. And I would also think that really increases the anxiety on the scene as well with the people who aren't instantly able to locate a loved one. You know, one person might have gone out the front, one might have gone out the back, and they don't know mm -hmm. that. You know, they might say, oh, this still, you know, my right. daughter or my husband's still inside. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you go to the meeting place. So everybody, for you and for us. Mm -hmm. Another thing, too, that was emphasized, I had looked a little bit on the uh, website for Fire Prevention Week information, and it's one of the things that when I read it, I was like, well, obviously, but then I was like, maybe not as obvious. Talks about having the number of your home clearly marked. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, it's a law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, second of all, it makes it a lot quicker uh, for us to identify the proper house. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so it should be, you know, good size letter, mm -hmm. somewhere you can see it from the street, po possibly illuminated, you know, mm -hmm. you might have a wall sconce. Right. But, uh, you know, it's, we're going to find it eventually, oh, but um, it's a lot easier if it's right there where mm -hmm. we're supposed to see it. Well, I think, too, when you think of the importance in situations like this, like every moment counts. People getting out of the house, the ability to locate the appropriate place. And I was actually thinking of it the other day as an aside. My dad painted the front door, and I was like, I came home, and I was like, front door is green. It wasn't green when I left, but he also <laughs> inadvertently painted over the house numbers. And I was oh, just geez. like, I was like, oh. So I was like, you know, just in the interest of public safety, you should probably take those down and fix that. And he was like never occurred to him. He was yeah. like, well, I just painted. I painted everything. And the reality is when you're giving an address, you're not instantly identifiable and every moment counts. You're going to have to get out your artist brush and <laughs> repaint those numbers for us. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of probably just purchasing some new ones. But uh, when we think of safety overall, I know last year we talked quite a bit about smoke detectors and the reality that they are recommending that you replace your smoke detector every 10 years, which was something I learned as mm -hmm. brand new information last year. Yeah, so. um, like we said before, you know, prob most people don't even have VCRs anymore. Everybody's got DVDs or you're watching mm -hmm. it on your phone. Technology changes. Right. Um, and it also gets old. Mm -hmm. So just to protect yourself, and as I always tell people, you know, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors are two of the best ways mm -hmm. to protect yourself and your family, you know, from fire um, situations. So yeah, they get old, they wear out. So you want to replace them every 10 years. And the way to tell, you take it off the wall, or the ceiling rather, mm -hmm. and it's right on the back of the detector, it'll tell you the manufacture date. So mm -hmm. 10 years after that. And of course, you want to change your batteries twice a year. Right. You know, we're changing our clock soon. That's mm -hmm. the easiest way to remember, change your clock, change your battery. Mm -hmm. And to test them at least once a month. You could test them once a day if you mm -hmm. wanted to, but at least once a month to make mm -hmm. sure that they're working. I think it's important, too, as you said, these things just become habit, right? So, I mean, I set the reminder on my phone twice a year, and it's just, it, it's what you do. But when I learned that information last year, I actually took down the smoke detector yeah. to see the manufacture date, and thankfully it was within the 10-year period. But I would, that's not something that would have crossed my mind. And I like to think, you know, we talk every year about fire safety, but I just wasn't aware that there's almost an expiration date on mm -hmm. these, and it's something to do. So... While you think of setting the reminders to check your, uh, the batteries in your smoke detector, practice your escape routes, I think these things just become ingrained in people. And it's so important, particularly if you start with your children at just at a younger age. I mean, when my girls were little, the rule was you couldn't turn the key in the car until they were buckled. Yeah. You couldn't yeah. start the car until mm -hmm. seatbelts were on. So then it just becomes part of what you do. So if your reality is on the first of every month you check your, the batteries in your smoke detector, then you just check your batteries on the first of the month. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and what I always tell the kids is they can help too, mm -hmm. you know, with their parents uh, or an adult's permission. You know, I mean, I don't want you getting up on a kitchen right. chair, but <laughs> get like a broom or a yep. hockey stick, you know, something that they can reach up and they can push the button. And again, that gives them more of a feeling of, of ownership, investment, like, hey, I can do this, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm learning this, I'm part of this. Yeah. So I want to circle back a little bit to when mm -hmm. you're in the classrooms talking with the kids. So as we talked about, information varies based on their age. Yeah. And kind of, so when you're in full gear and then as you start to, you know, take the various equipment off, what kind of reactions do you get from the children? <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, they, it, there's different ones. Most of the kids are all, you know, they all want to come up and, and see it and touch it and put it on. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we usually, we don't even put it on. We make the teacher put it on. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> you know, because that, again, that gets them focused. Mm -hmm. You know, because when they're really young, you know, some of them start wandering around, yeah. and, you know, their eyes. Uh, it's funny, though. It's, it's cool. And I tell you, it's, I always say to them, you know, um, 
if you have any questions, save them for the end. Mm -hmm. And you know, then I have to remind them a question usually starts with who, what, or where. Because yeah. <laughs> I all generally get um, one time, <laughs> uh, which is really fun and right. interesting, you know. But it's we don't we only have such a small mm -hmm. time frame with them. But uh, yeah, the kids they like it. Yeah. Well, I think, too, like you said, the importance of involving them in it, right? Understanding that you can help your mom or dad or whomever in your household to really practice these things. And then, you know, as I said, when things become habit, good or bad, things just become a habit. So there definitely is the importance of the continuity of that, I think. Because even I think of ourselves as adults, it's like, all right, I'll check it. And then you're mm -hmm. like, oh, wait, something came up. Right. And then, you know, but I think if you just, if it becomes just as a set habit with you, then it's just something that's automatic to do. And I know we had talked a little bit uh, on previous shows about now the combination detectors. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to go back to that because you had mentioned the importance of carbon monoxide detectors as well. Yeah, yeah. It's the, um, you know, they come two and one. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they're two different signals. You know, there's four beeps mm -hmm. for uh, uh, the, like the carbon monoxide, I believe, and then a continuous mm -hmm. beep for the smoke detector. But they talk, too. These yes. new ones all talk. And it'll tell you smoke. Or carbon monoxide get out, and you know, and you can program them, and it will tell you because you're you're going to have more than one in the in the house. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have one on every level. Yeah. You have to have a um, detectors within ten feet of a bedroom. So you know, if the if you are in the kitchen and the one in the front hall goes off, it's going to say fire, fire, hallway, mm -hmm. front hallway, whatever you programmed it mm -hmm. to. Again, best protection that there's out there. You know, a lot of new construction they're putting uh, residential sprinklers, but you know, mm -hmm. most of this old stuff doesn't have right. it, you're not going to have it, you mm -hmm. know. Um, like I said, all that new construction, they generally right. are doing it. So the smoke and carbon monoxide detectors are your best protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, again, that it just seems very automatic, but to realize, you know, you're responsible for your own safety, so it's important to learn this information. Uh, as we start talking a little bit, um, despite the beautiful weather we've had, mm -hmm. at some point it is going to turn cold and snowy, according to the Farmer's Almanac, apparently really oh. snowy and really cold. Oh, boy. I refuse <laughs> to believe that because it's just not going to happen. <laughs> but looking ahead to that, as we start talking when snow accumulates, uh, we've talked a bit before about the dangers of vents being blocked and the potential backup for things like that. Can you talk a little bit about that safety? Yes. Um, now with the heating season almost upon us, the first thing you want to do, again, a, a great way to protect yourself and your family is to have a licensed professional uh, burner technician check it out, clean it if it needs it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the vents, now a lot of these new uh, burners, you know, they, they don't go up through the chimney anymore. Mm -hmm. They go that little PVC pipe out into your driveway. Right. You know, they're, they're not that high off the ground. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, that snowy winter we had three years ago when it was 10 feet, yes. <laughs> you know, those things get blocked and that will... Mm -hmm. um, let the carbon monoxide build up in the home. So you want to keep that clear. You know, walk around your house, see if you have it. Mm -hmm. And remember when it snows to, to make sure that's clear. And again, make sure the carbon monoxide detector's working properly. I think, unfortunately, we often hear those stories in the news about that of someone oh, who, you know, that's how, where the people carbon are trying to do what's best, which is clearing the snow to keep a safe pathway and inadvertently covering up those mm -hmm. vents. Well, that's where the carbon monoxide law came from because mm -hmm. uh, it had started happening. Like I said, that's a relatively new... Mm -hmm. um, technology for burners yes and that's where it, that's where it came about because it had happened a few times unfortunately that and the other danger too that I think people sometimes overlook in kind of the haste of life is when you're clearing your car you know the tailpipe <laughs> becomes blocked yeah. people are shoveling and then you know you get back in your car to warm up and unfortunately I feel like every winter we hear this story if not in our area around the region that someone you know you're out in the freezing cold you're trying to or you put your child in the car while oh, you're warming yes. it up yeah. and not realizing again the dangers of that yeah you know and that's something it's funny when I do go into schools that often mm -hmm. I think I've said to you there's always that one kid that hits me with something that I never thought of mm -hmm. right uh, and it's great because it's opens up you know more uh, discussion and that's something like we don't really teach that but it's true mm -hmm. you know you, you got because I do it I go out there start my car yeah. right up you know I want right. warm when I get in there mm -hmm. so yeah you want to make sure that tailpipe is clear too yeah I think of it sometime when you would reference that snowmageddon that we lived through there <laughs> and realizing you know parking's at a premium and then you know your car is kind of backed into mm -hmm. a snow drift mm -hmm. as you're clearing it in that sense I mean when you thought think of the time involved that winter of clearing out your car you're out there forever in a day, and the reality is if you have a young one and you're not leaving in the home alone, you're going to put them in the car to keep them warm. So I think the thing that always surprises me is how quickly people become overcome 
by carbon monoxide. When we hear the stories of the vents being blocked in a home or, you know, the situations that happen in cars. This is not, you don't have to be exposed for three hours. Right, yeah. It, it's very unsettling when you think of that, so. Carbon monoxide in the bloodstream attaches um, to blood cells quicker than oxygen. Mm -hmm. And it builds up. It's, it, um, you know, it, 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 it continuously builds up if you mm -hmm. don't get out back out in the fresh air. Right. Very, very Yeah, you can get overcome rapidly. Hmm. Another thing that is always important to discuss as the weather does turn colder, people uh, increase the use of space heaters. <laughs> so what are our recommendations about those? Don't use them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if, if someone <laughs> is to use a space heater, we know um, they're supposed to have that label on them that yeah. indicates they have been certified, I yeah, believe. Yeah, UL, United Laboratories, uh, there's a couple of things, but make sure it's a... a a professional testing lab that's got it's got mm -hmm. that certificate always inspect like the cord make sure it's not getting worn or, mm -hmm. you know uh, you're not supposed to use um, um, extension cords with them mm -hmm. either and they, they got to be three feet from anything that can burn which so the drapes uh, mm -hmm. the furniture the couch right. your legs mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean right. so you want to keep it three feet away from anything that can burn mm -hmm. and always shut them off when you're leaving the room or especially if you go going out Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and you know, the point of this, again, it isn't to scare people with no, all of no. this information, but it really is just things that you need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. So when we think of safety planning overall, right, having the escape routes, a meeting place, the importance of checking the equipment, a as a firefighter, as someone who's responding to these, do you see a notable difference when you're responding to a fire, which thankfully we do not have a lot of in our city? Mm -hmm. um, for people, have you ever had conversations with people who have actually had practiced the escape routes or have the identified meeting place? Oh, absolutely. Almost every time we go out in the community. I had one. We were down at Assembly Row, a toucher truck a while ago, and this uh, woman came up to me. They didn't live in Somerville, but they were telling me the, the kid was probably six years old. And she said somehow or other he got, he went into the cellar and turned on his father's like torch, like a welding torch. Oh, my. And she said, you know, the smoke detector went off. She went down, you know, she immediately shut off the gas, grabbed him, ran outside, and called 911. We often hear stories about people. Um, you can go on the Department of Fire Services website, uh, the SAFE program. There's dozens, hundreds of examples through the years mm -hmm. uh, of kids that have gone through the program and then had some kind of emergency at home, even if it's something simple like calling 911. But they know what to do, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, there's a, almost every time we go out in the community, someone has a story of an incident and usually luckily they're minor mm -hmm. you know we've also t we talk to the kids about it's not just fire that can burn us you know mm -hmm. uh, hot liquids you know so if somebody's cooking you know boiling water for pasta or soup or tea mm -hmm. um, and if you're cooking you know this is for us uh, I know I'm getting older and forgetful <laughs> you know uh, don't walk out of the room leaving the pot on mm -hmm. you know I, I, I say just set the timer like on your microwave if you mm -hmm. forget you know I do it all the time because I am getting forgetful <laughs> Uh, you know, and, we, and that's what you want. You want to practice, you know, good housekeeping, and uh, mm -hmm. it's all part of fire safety. You know, the, mm -hmm. you know, don't have the uh, um, dish towel next to the stove. Mm -hmm. Don't put your bundles next to the stove. You know, the the plastic or the paper mm -hmm. bags they could catch. It's it's simple stuff, but you got to think about it once in a while. Yeah, it is sometimes um, kind of again things that you just do automatically, and then sometimes I, I think I've literally heard your voice in my head sometimes when <laughs> like doing things in the kitchen, like you realize. <laughs> One of the points you had brought up before was about the sleeves of your rope. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those, like, you know, you're doing stuff and you're not realizing. And I, I've done it myself. Go to reach across and it's like, oh, wait, yep. you just, you don't realize. Or, you know, you have a pot holder nearby, your dish towel, something like that. And I think it's important, and I'm glad you brought it to this point. We don't think of fire as just fire, right. right? I mean, there are smaller things that are contained or can become uncontained and could spread to a larger fire, but just kind of, you know, what you're doing in your everyday life. I mean, I, I cook supper. I don't necessarily think that I am potentially starting a small fire, mm -hmm. but the reality is, you know, something sparks up or things are happening in the warm weather, people are grilling. There are lots of opportunities where I think, you know, increased knowledge definitely helps with your personal safety and it, as much as we want to get in the habit of practicing the escape routes and doing that we almost want to get out of the habit of some of the shortcuts we've taken that mm -hmm. aren't quite as safe yeah like you said with the cold weather coming um you know you're wearing your bathrobe you're gonna mm -hmm. make your tea or coffee 
and generally they do have those mm -hmm. you know big cuffs so you know roll it up mm -hmm. take it off put an elastic around it something like that mm -hmm. you know um, it, it, it's like I said it's these little things you know we always tell kids big fires start small mm -hmm. that, that <laughs> is very true since we're talking about it now what we also tell people kids especially if you do if your clothing or your person does catch on fire mm -hmm. Stop, drop, and roll. Stop right where you are. Cover, get on the floor, roll, cover your face, and roll back and forth because you'll eventually put that out. And of course, always call 911. Go to the mm -hmm. doctor. Make sure you know it's not uh, something that needs attention. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things too. I mean, that's such simple advice to stop, drop, and roll, which I feel has been from the beginning of time. Like that message has never changed. We talk about different themes and things. But the reality is that is the quickest way to protect yourself when, if something like that were to happen with you and the importance of calling 911. So when you're in this situation, obviously the steps you would want to go through if your smoke detector, carbon monoxide detector or something is going off or if you see something without the um, information coming from the detector, you want to get out of the home, go to your meeting spot. Are you calling 911 then? Yes, absolutely. Get outside first and then call us. You know, Oftentimes people are like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, you know, it's our job. We, mm -hmm. you know, we want to get it while it's small. Right. We make sure nothing's going on. We don't want it coming out the windows. Right. You know? Well, I think the importance too. I mean, you'd rather come to something that turns out to be nothing, nothing. than for people to delay calling emergency response and then find yourself in a situation that you kind of can't get out of. You know, it doesn't take very long from the, as we call it, incipient stage, or, mm -hmm. which means the beginning. Uh, to a full-fledged fire they've done we we actually have training videos um, like they throw a match in a wastebasket and mm -hmm. in five minutes the whole room's on fire you know it yeah. doesn't take long so again this is the whole thing about the, the quick response get out quickly call us that we'll get there quickly mm -hmm. well, and, and we also excuse me no, I didn't interrupt ahead. you you know it's different today everybody's got a phone in their pocket you know mm -hmm. in the old days we always said don't assume somebody else called but even right. if a hundred people have a phone don't assume somebody called mm -hmm. if you call and somebody already called they'll say thank you we got the call mm -hmm. you know that's actually what i was just going to say it would be better to have ten people your neighbors and everyone calling saying this is happening than for someone to just be like well someone must have seen it or you know like you said mm -hmm. in this day of technology you assume it's, it's probably you know being live streamed somewhere but yeah. the reality <laughs> is it's better, as you said, to continue to call because there's always going to be a response from our first responders and the dispatcher is just going to say, thank you for sharing the information. And you're not going to be chastised for providing the information no, that someone all, else did. So. As long as it's not false call. Right. You know, that's yeah. illegal and wrong. Yeah. But um, even if you think this a problem, you think mm -hmm. there's an emergency, there's an emergency and we'll right. check it out. Um, that is uh, one phrase, though, we kind of hate to, to hear, like when they dispatch us, if they say receiving calls, that usually means, mm -hmm. you know, something big is happening. Right. But call us, yeah, as mm -hmm. long as it's not malicious. No, that, that's, uh, I think, a good way to wrap that up, the importance of contacting fire, police, emergency, whatever the situation is, first responders are going to respond. It's right there in the name of their job, <laughs> being a first responder. So I want to thank you again for taking the time to come on, as I said, I know that we have a conversation like this every year, but I really think education provides power to people and definitely increases the comfort level on what is a very difficult topic to discuss. Yeah, as, again, it's my pleasure. I thank you for having me and letting us you know, get this information out there. Um, it's, 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 it's a passion for me. I really um, enjoy, especially going into the schools, but mm -hmm. even with the adults, uh, you know, we do it with the elderly now too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's a, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. As always, I'd like to thank the production crew, Steve DiCarlo and George Wood. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next month.